Welcome everyone. My name is Pasquale Bosso and I am a member of the outreach activity team of the International Society for Quantum Gravity. Today, I will have the great pleasure of interviewing uh, Professor John Donald. I hope that my pronunciation is correct. Um, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. Um, professor Donald is uh, currently an emeritus professor at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, however, uh, I would like to ask him to tell us a little bit about his story, so about his uh, academic career, if you don't mind. If you want. Okay, so I can, uh, I'm happy to start. I, I entered physics quite a while ago, as you can tell from my lack of hair. Um, I started as a particle physicist doing quark models in the weak interactions and did that for many years, moving into what became effective field theory, and then moving from there into gravitational effective field theory, and then now working mostly in in gravitational physics. So it's a it's a funny trajectory overall because I changed fields more or less totally um but it's all theoretical physics it all uses quantum field theory have the, you always worked in at the massachusetts university or did you change so i was a graduate student here at university of massachusetts uh barry holstein was my thesis advisor i then went off and did a postdoc at carnegie mellon another one at mit and then was fortunate enough to get invited back to the faculty here. Um, my in 1980. And I've been here since aside from sabbaticals at CERN and the IHES in Paris and places like that. Um, and so most of my career has been here. It's okay. um, it was my collaborators when I came back were, and both as a student, and then when I first came back were Barry Holstein and Eugene Golovich. We did a lot of particle physics together. Um, and then uh, Barry, who has uh, moved a bit into the gravitational physics also, uh, following the effective field theory work that I did. Mm -hmm. So I see that uh, well, you changed a little bit topic, although you remain in the broad area of uh, uh, well, theoretical physics and high energy physics, and then you went towards um, effective field theory and gravitational field theory. Right. And uh, so were you always interested in these topics or your interest, in, uh, interest changed with time? So I, I was interested in general relativity as when I was starting off. We we actually didn't have anyone who taught relativity at, at the university at that time. And so we formed a little self-teaching seminar. And so we sort of taught ourselves out of Steve Weinberg's book. Um, and I used to follow the, the work on field theory and, and general relativity, mainly the British school, um, the Burrell and Davies, style the that and i learned a lot of interesting field theory from that there was a style of field theory that uh, we were not using that much in particle physics and i found it interesting and even back when i first joined the the department as a professor i my first course i had a segment on i was teaching gauge theory and had a segment on general relativity as a gauge theory following kibble's work oh, um, so it was always there it just was not that professionally active i think if i was trying to tell the the story of the um trajectory a little bit more detail. So the early work was on 
quirk models and I did work on the spectrum of gluons and glue balls and the like. Um, at some stage, the theory of effective field theory developed in Carroll perturbation theory. It started off, um, and I was doing chiral predictions there at, at the time. Chiral symmetry is a symmetry that allows, that describes the low energy behavior of, of pions and photons in quantum chromodynamics. And much of the early work was sort of model building. But then the, when effective field theory started being applied, you realize that it became a, a rigorous way of treating some of these, some of these calculations. And so that became a, that was, that was exciting to start having rigorous techniques. The, the foundational work that, at least for me, there was the work by Gasser and Leutfeller on interactions of pions and photons. It became chiral perturbation theory as a way of describing low energy QCD. And it became it was a shocking technique in a way for people that had grown up using standard field theory at the time, because you it was a non-renormalizable theory. So one that mm -hmm. technically was thought to be unable to be treated using quantum techniques. Yet here we were doing ex comparisons with experiment and calculations that what controlled calculations at one loop order, two loop order. And um, that realization was, was exciting at the time and uh, changes the way we think about field theory in a way. Okay, that's that's very interesting. And uh, well, you mentioned sometimes um, effective the effective theory. So can you tell us a little bit what effective field theory is? Yes. So exactly. Yes. So this is the the technique that that I brought to general relativity in some sense um, in the end. But what it is at its foundation is it's using field theory at low energies where you realize you don't need to know the theory, the full theory defined at all energies. It's mm -hmm. so a you basically if you're doing physics at some scale, like the scale, you only need to know what are the interactions and degrees of freedom appropriate to that scale. The there is undoubtedly new physics that we don't know at very short distance scales, but we don't need to know that to do physics at, at our present scale. And that was in some ways a, a um, revelation because we were used to doing renormalizable field theories where we are trying to define the theory at all energies. And um, for some theories, that's just not possible. And so this allowed us to move into the treatment of, of physics that we knew existed, but without having to make it into a renormalizable field theory. And it's completely general because all the physics from the very high energy scales that you don't know gets a gets parameterized in terms of a small number of constants that you you go out and you measure like the electron mass and the pi on decay constant things that you can't calculate because it involves physics that you don't know but nevertheless you can measure it and then use that to make predictions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So in some sense, can could we say that, uh, well, actually, I, I suppose you said it. So uh, can we say that uh, effective field theory is in a way um, describing 
what on, uh, uh, the true theory would be in terms of the language of a theory that we, do, that we already know, something like that. Yeah, so it is the low energy description of, of whatever the true theory is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's effect, the effective in two senses of the words. One is it's the word sometimes is used to mean these are the, the effects that propagate down from high energies. Mm -hmm. But it's also effective in the sense that it's useful. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 the things that are happening, the dynamics, the particles and interactions that are going on here and now, and those are what we all that what we need to know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I was before the interview. I was looking at your website, and I found a um, uh, metaphor that I I found it very interesting. So. You compared uh, well the effect of your theory uh, with the description of C waves in some sense, right? So uh, the way we describe C waves in terms of waves, right. forgetting for a moment that well C is is made of atoms and molecules and everything. So that's yeah, I found it very illustrative. Um, right. And uh, so, how does this? apply to quantum gravity in the sense that um well you said we, we said that quantum gravity well the true quote unquote theory of quantum gravity uh, we don't know it yet right so we need to have this sort of effective approach to, to quantum gravity and so um what can you tell us uh, or um, about gravity using uh, effective field theory Right. So, in fact, gravity fits the effect of field theory framework um, probably ideally it, in the sense that, as you say, we don't know the full theory, but we have good evidence for the interactions at the, inter the scales that we work at. We, we, have, we know that it's general relativity. To, to a good approximation. Um, we know that there are gravity waves exist. The, the standard quantization techniques turns those gravity waves into gravitons when you, when you treat it. Um, so we, we, it's all known physics at the scales that we're working at. And the trick comes in using the effective field theory to, to know what is predictable and what's not at those scales. Mm -hmm. So there are some things that are not predictable. We, we can't predict the high energy behavior at all. We can, uh, we can, however, we can make some calculations that are reliable calculations because they're only sensitive to low energy. And effective field theory is a technique allows us to make that separation. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can be pedagogical for a moment, the, the, the main difference in this separation is the distance scale or the energy scale and the uncertainty principle. So if you come from very, if your effects are from very high energies, they look local on our scales by the uncertainty principle. Mm -hmm. If they come from, low energies they they can involve propagation over long distances because of again the uncertainty principle mm. <clears throat> so effective field theory parameterizes the unknown stuff in terms of a small set of local interactions mm -hmm. but then calculates the non-local stuff because that only involves the low low energy scales okay but there's my instant pedagogy yeah, no, that's that's perfect. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, still talking about uh, gravity, and uh, um, so we had some other interview in the past talking about phenomenology of uh, quantum gravity. Uh, so, is there any any um, intersection, let's say, between phenomenology and uh, um, uh, effective field theory. So 
most of the quantum corrections that we calculate are, are small. Mm -hmm. So it, they're, they're hard to measure. In principle, they're measurable. In mm -hmm. practice, it's it's the the numbers come out to be small, mm -hmm. um, but the the techniques that we're using in doing this are essentially the same ones that I mentioned in chiral perturbation theory, where we do make contact with experiment. Um, we know how to do this long distance and short distance separation, and calculate effects in low energy QCD that involve non-renormalizable interactions mm -hmm. and use effective field theory. So the techniques have all, all been used to do comparisons with experiment. And then when we convert them over to gravity, we find <clears throat> that there are no free parameters. We, we just make the predictions that are that the theory tells us, and the theory tells us that, that on ordinary scales, these are small because gravity is much weaker than other forces at ordinary scales. Mm -hmm. um, I always, I try to make this into a positive, I, you know, say that the, um, when you do perturbation theory, your theory is best defined when your perturbations are small and becomes ill-defined if they become big. Mm. And in general relativity, the, the perturbations are, are incredibly tiny. So instead of being the worst quantum theory that we have, they're actually the best quantum theory because the, the calculations are in, incredibly precise. Mm -hmm. I see, no, that's interesting perspective on this. And um, uh, well, another um, topic you have worked on is uh, emerging, uh, emerging physics, right? So having some right. um, emerging phenomenon from, from uh, some background models and background theory. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Right. So, yes, I the the idea of emergent physics is that the low energy description doesn't have to match even in the degrees of freedom to the high energy physics. And the example that I tend to use is a solid. If you have a solid, your, your high energy description is your atoms interacting, bouncing into each other. And low energies, it's, it's phonon waves, basically the sound waves um are the the description that emerges at low energies these become quantized and are used in in doing quantum calculations and so in a way that's an effect of field theory to to the high energy physics is the atoms the low energy physics is the phonons and that's the picture that one may have of gravity in some scale there's some high energy degrees of freedom that we don't know what they are, but the low energy ones are graviton waves, which we quantize. Um, and that's, there's a, a, a thread of the field that, that says, hopes that this is the emerge, the physics of, of uh, to describe all of us. This goes back to some work with Holger Nielsen, which said that perhaps the world is completely random at the lowest scales, but the things that emerge at the at, at, at the highest scales are the smallest distances. Uh, but things that emerge are ones that are protected by symmetries at low energies, such as U1, SU2, SU3. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps that's why we have these gauge fields and chiral fermions at low energies. I always found that attractive. I haven't found that it's, I've been able to do much with it. I, I wish I could do more, uh, but it's a, it's a lovely 
thought for what what the world could look like. In some ways, it's the opposite of the standard paradigm where you get add more and more symmetries at high energies. Here you add you get more and more randomness and less symmetries, and the symmetry emerges at low energies. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, an, it's another paradigm. But I, see. That's, I, I, I don't think we have any evidence for it, and I, I, and I at the moment don't have the next my next project in it either. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. No. That's that's uh, that's very interesting, and uh, as you mentioned, it's very interesting. Um, you know that it has a sort of different paradigm with respect to what we usually think, right? So, for example, uh, in uh, uh, usual uh, in the standard model of particle physics, as you mentioned, so we go from uh, higher uh, symmetry from a high symmetry to a you know we break the symmetry and we have all the gauge <clears throat> interactions that we know. Um, so can you, um, so uh, you were mentioning that also gravity should be emergent in some way. Would it also space-time be emergent at that point? Yeah. Presumably. Um, mm -hmm. in, in some ways, this, this is worked on in these information um, theoretic approaches at the moment uh, you know it's to what extent is the space time itself the a a fundamental description mm -hmm. yeah I think I think there's you know potential there you know of course my the worry is that we won't be able to to know the answer I think it's a there are barriers to us knowing it mainly because it has to happen at distant scales that we can't probe so as a as a phenomenologist it's it's tough to um, to feel that we're going to know what the what the answer is mm -hmm. nevertheless it's it's an interesting idea I, I think it you know if you won't know if you can test it until you just develop the theory so Let's mm -hmm. go ahead and develop the theory. Yeah, yeah, no, it is interesting. And um, so going a little bit back to um, effective field theory and yeah. uh, gravitational field theory. Um, so um, at the moment, we are very far away from, and also actually uh, going back also to the discussion of phenomenology and possibly testing. Uh, at the moment, in terms of energy, we are quite far away from the um, quantum gravity scale, which is usually the Planck scale of energy, right? So that's been set to the Planck scale. Um, and uh, so, as you mentioned, the effects from quantum field theory are usually very small. Uh, can we still say something on, uh, on uh, gravity, on the fear of gravity? Uh, based on effective field theory, and can we, let's say, um, make some prediction of some property that we expect from the uh, full theory of gravity? You know, I think we can say some things that are interesting mm -hmm. uh, for the full theory. The and the, we you can do that by looking at the deviations from our classical expectation of for general relativity that the effect of field theory tells you because the effect of field theory will magnify these as you get to higher energies and shorter scales mm -hmm. and while while the effect of field theory won't be able to predict the ultimate um, behavior it will be able to give you clues as to what's going on in that direction. It's, so, I mean, an example of this is the, so in the classical theory, 
the particles travel along geodesics. And so the light cones and geodesics are exceptionally well, are well-defined quantities that we build much of our theoretical framework about. However, when you calculate the behavior of massless particles moving in a gravitational field, in the effective field theory, there are corrections to that behavior. And it comes because a, a quantum field emitting quantum particles, virtual quantum particles, is sensitive not only to the gravitational field al along this trajectory, but also in the neighborhood of the trajectory. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, because a quantum particle can be split up and be recombined, it can feel the gravitational field over a larger area. In some sense, it's like tidal effects. Mm -hmm. And so when we do the calculation of massless particles moving in a gravitational field, we find that they, one, they don't move along the classical geodesic and they get some corrections. But two, they also are not universal in the sense that gravitons and photons and spin zero particles and fermions travel along different trajectories. Okay. I mean, the average, the average of all of a graviton is not going to have the same average as a photon. So it's a little spread out, it's fuzzy. But if you define the, the peak of the trajectory, you find that they behave differently. And this, this tells us that, that as we approach the deep quantum regime, that geodesics are not well-defined quantities anymore because if light and gravitons follow different trajectories, we don't know which one to use for the geodesic. And Penrose mm -hmm. diagrams then are not well-defined quantum objects in the deep quantum regime. So while it doesn't tell us what, how to go beyond that, it does tell us that, that if we're using these concepts in exploring quantum gravity, we're using uncontrolled approximations. So, I mean, that's a, uh, it's a hint from the effective field theory about what it, is valid and what's not in the the full theory. Of course, yeah. I mean, that's that's a, that's an excellent point. So, using effective field theory or properties that we can um, um, find using, uh, let's say, low energy approximation to characterize the full theory. That's that's something that. Um, that's, First of all, it's very interesting, but it also would be very important since the full theory is so far away, as we said. Um, and also, I found very intriguing, as you mentioned, that uh, different particles, different fields will have different average trajectories, so to say. Um, that's that's pretty um, pretty interesting. Um, so, in some sense, you would expect that. Uh, uh, for example, the the the, the photons and gravitons emitted from the sun, say, will travel along different different lines in some sense. Uh, that that's that's the implication. Yes. Um, okay. You know, again, these effects are very small at ordinary energy. Of course. Yeah. Um, of course. But nevertheless, it it does give you some some insight into what happens as you they stop being small and start becoming important. Mm -hmm. In principle, one could also have some sort of accum um, accumulation, some cumulative effect, I think of um, yeah, yes. large distances. And right, so the, this is the holy grail of, of trying to do these corrections is to find something where the effects build up enough that perhaps they could be observable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the, the argument is is that perhaps if you know you have a small effect in a but a large lever arm of some form, that you could end up seeing a, an effect. 
And here mm. it, would, it would never be an effect where you're measuring some deviation from unity because the effects will still be tiny, but perhaps you could find something that's, that's strictly zero in general relativity to all orders in the, in the classical expansion, yet mm -hmm. it's something that's not zero in quantum theory. Okay. I, this, as I said, is the holy grail. I haven't found it or else I would have been mentioning this much earlier. Okay, um, but I will also expect that, uh, well, effectively theory and, um, well, in principle, also the full theory should reduce somehow to the to the theory of, uh, well, field theory on one side and general relativity on the other side, right? Right. And uh, but effective field theory, I, I also expect that it's a, it's a fully quantum theory while general relativity is, is purely classical. Right. So how, how do you manage to go to general relativity, for example? Right, so th this is the, let, let's, let's go back in some sense to this union of the, the, the two, because it's, it's interesting. Um, we're used to our theories being valid over some energy scales. You know, Newtonian theory uh, falls apart after a while, but is valid over a certain range. Um, and the, the trouble with the old descriptions of quantum gravity, the conflicts of quantum mechanics and gravity, were that they, they were telling, saying that we have a theory of quantum mechanics that, that's valid at this scale and a theory of general relativity that's valid at this scale, and they're in conflict. And that's something that's dipped outside of our standard paradigm of having theories that are valid at some scales and then modifying it beyond that. And so that should really make you sick to your stomach. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the the classic description of the the problems of quantum gravity that the the theories of quantum mechanics and the theories of general relativity are incompatible. And I think, so this is where I started. Um, but then one realizes as you start looking for what, what is the problem, that that's not really correct. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, the the period of time that I worked on chiral perturbation theory was formative for that insight because there we had a theory that had all the properties that general relativity has. It has nonlinear interactions um, in the sense that the the action that you describe the world at the lowest energy contains all powers of the pion field. Mm -hmm. Just like if I expanded the general relativistic action in terms of gravitons or gravitational fields, it has all powers. Um, so it's nonlinear. It's non-renormalizable in the technical sense of, of that you when you do loops, you don't renormalize this, your original parameters of your theory. And so it has all the characteristics that general relativity does when viewed as a field theory. And so this, in some sense, is the remnant of the fact that I was always interested in in general relativity on the side while doing particle physics. So here I'm mm -hmm. doing pion physics. But I know general relativity on the side. And then I think anybody who's in that situation would see that general relativity has the same characteristic that the as a field theory as the pion chiral perturbation theory did. And in fact, it Weinberg in one of his foundational papers from 1979 more or less says that. He says that. General relativity should be viewed as an effective field theory, though he didn't take it beyond 
that step very much. Um, and so I think the the insight at that stage was obvious to anybody who knew effective field theory and chiral perturbation theory. Um, and then at some stage uh, during that in the 80s, I realized that if you if you use these techniques, you would get a finite prediction for the quantum correction to the Newtonian potential. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the the insight there is basically there are also in chiral perturbation theory systems where you get finite predictions and you we we know how to separate them. Um separate the unknowns from the from the knowns in the effective field theory. And so at that stage, I used to enjoy whenever we had relativists around, I would I kid them and say that I knew how to calculate the quantum correction to the Newtonian potential. And the typical reaction is, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. It's not renormalizable. Um, but I, I, and I also at that stage knew there was too small to be measured. Okay, you, it's easy to do a dimensional analysis, and it's too small. Um, but so, but you know, having seen the techniques, it was you knew that you could do it. You also knew it was a painful calculation because mm -hmm. the general relativity with all these indices or loop diagrams is, is a pain. Anyhow, let me just finish that story that just because it's a little bit yeah, just, the, the the after several years of kidding the relativists, I decided I should eventually do it. Um, even if it was going to be painful. So my we my family went off to the south of France, we did a house exchange with a family there. And in the south of France, life is slow and pleasant. And um, so in the mornings, nothing was happening. We just, it was, we just existed all morning, then we'll do something in the afternoon. So I started to do the calculation. I brought along Weinberg's book and a pad of paper and started doing the, the calculation. Um, of the quantum correction to the Newtonian potential there. And uh, eventually calculated a few diagrams that were sufficient to show how, how it could be calculated. And uh, that was the foundation for the original calculation that I published uh, on how to use effective field theory to make finite predictions. Um, and at at that stage, all my uh, effective field theory friends, my chiral perturbation theory friends, had the reaction. Well, that's so obvious. Why did you bother to do it? Instead of the, the it's too crazy. And the answer is somewhere in between. Of course, there's the the reason you do it. I did it there is to show that this phrasing of the problems of quantum gravity was not correct, that at ordinary energies, the theories merge appropriately, that there, there's no conflict on the scales where we've tested both theories. Mm -hmm. that the, that the, and so, uh, it, and it's even though it's still said today that, that general relativity and quantum mechanics are incompatible, that's just, that's not true. Mm -hmm. There's, there are regions where they're compatible and regions where we have no idea what's going on. And, and that, that changes the paradigm tremendously. Okay. So um, the, my motivation then was, was not that it was going to be good phenomenology because it wouldn't be measurable, but just to show that, that we knew how to do calculations in the union of general relativity and quantum field theory. Okay. 
That's a, that's a very interesting story. And also, it's an excellent point that not always GR and um, quantum field theory are incompatible, which um, also this incompatibility, it's usually, as you, as you mentioned, it's usually used as the um, reason to study quantum gravity. Right? So, right. Um, but as you mentioned, this compatibility, incompatibility happens only at some scales, or at least it's relevant only at some scales, which uh, right. I suppose it's the Planck scale at this point when the energy of both theories are compatible. Yeah, um, let, let me actually put a little caveat into that, just just in, in the spirit of uh, that's it. It's true that the the um, standard breakdown of effective filters can be high at high energies. Um, in, in the case of gravity, we have a slightly different situation in that gravitational effects build up over long scales. Mm -hmm. And there are some non-trivial classical effects over long scales like formations of black holes. Mm -hmm. So the, the behavior on very long scales is, is outside of present effective field theory techniques, partially because the, the effects build up and can be classical effects can be quite large. And so um, if you're sensitive, not only to this local region here where the curvature is very small, but to very long distances, uh, there are uncertainties in that, in that situation. But those uncertainties are shared by other field theories also. If you have photons propagating past the black hole, black hole it's, not, it's not totally clear how you can make a prediction on scales that are um, using QED on scales past the black hole. Mm -hmm. so there is a frontier also for infrared quantum effects. Which I think has been too lightly explored. Okay. Um, well, this suggests many, many further questions. Uh, one would be so um, we know that black holes, of course, um, are a prediction of well, can be considered a prediction of GR. And in this sense, what does effective field theory tell us uh, regarding black holes? Do we have any? implications on those? Or? Yeah, so in effective field theory, classical big black holes would look unchanged. Okay. And and the, you know, classically the black hole horizon locally is not a, it's not a curvature singularity. It's, and so if you, ch if you're, if we could in principle right here be passing the, the horizon of a very, really enormous black hole, and we would, in principle, might not notice. Mm -hmm. um, but, and so I, I would think that the first approximation, the fact of field theory would suggest that black holes are, are, are locally, um, standard classical black holes. Okay. The, there is a, a, you know, the information paradox is, is one, if black holes do eventually evaporate, that becomes a, a, an infrared quantum gravity issue, much like the others that I described, mm -hmm. um, for which the resolution is not obvious. I would like myself to revisit the issue of whether uh, black holes really do have to um, evaporate or at, at their end game. The end, end is, of course, outside the realm of effective field theory. It's outside of the realm of any of the theories that we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, it's it's an interesting 
Um, question that raises questions about really extreme infrared quantum physics. Yes, yeah, it is. And um, uh, still another question suggested by, by your story is actually the, the infrared uh, effect, because one usually thinks of, of quantum gravity in terms of ultraviolet, so high energy Right. Regimes, high energy effects. Uh, but as you mentioned, very little is usually said about uh, um, infrared regimes, so low energy effects. Um, do you have any perspective? Do you have any thought on that? Well, yes, I, I mean, I do. Some of it is on the technical side. I mean, one of the, the technical ways that you might deal with some of these is that is to by piecing together locally flat regions because mm -hmm. the equivalence principle tells us that in in a in a local region around us we can make the the um the field theory description essentially flat um by choosing your coordinates wisely and so if you if if we're trying to look at these classical solutions, physics around the classical solutions, you can imagine patching together a series of regions where the um, the space times are are treatable within those regions, and then matching the boundaries in some way. So this is a technical comment, of course, but. You asked if I had some ideas. Well, so that's one of the ideas. Uh, I. It seems to me a daunting task, and it may require someone smarter than me to actually carry it out. But there, uh, I do have the the hopes of taking a look at it. Thanks, and um, well, we are slowly approaching um, towards the, the, the end of our um, our interview. So one thing that I would like to ask, so we talked a little bit of, uh, well, your research topic, of course, um, effective field theory, we talked a little bit of quantum gravity. And something that we never mentioned is, why do we need quantum gravity at all at this point? Um, so we have GR that works very well. We have quantum field theory that works very well. As we said, in a good interval of energy, um, they are compatible. They, are, they don't have big problems. So why do we need quantum gravity at all? Mm -hmm. Well, the this union that we have, the effective field theory of gravity, <laughs> does tell you that there is, that, that if we, we need either new understanding or a new theory. Mm -hmm. The the it tells you that the theory becomes sick at at certain energies. It basically it's not completely clear that the theory is is in fact irredeemable. But it, it's certainly clear that it's irredeemable with our present techniques. So, so you need you need something. Mm -hmm. The theory, using what we know at present, is sick at at high energy scales, and, and we don't know how to treat it. So, I think there's there's a lot of good motivation for thinking about the ultraviolet completion of quantum gravity mm -hmm. and we're in some sense forced to that because we know that both these theories quantum mechanics and gravity exist it's not like we're speculating on some new particle that may or may not be produced at the lhc here the theories we know exist we know that there is problems when when pushed to extreme energies so it's worth trying to figure out how to solve them. Um, the 
disadvantage, as I mentioned, is that we're probably unlikely to know the answer. But it's, at this stage, we have so few great solutions to the, the problem that it's worth looking at to find, to find more solutions. Um, yeah, string theory is, is one potential one, but it's a very extreme. It says the world is, has dimensions and degrees of freedom very different from what we, what we know. There may be more conservative ways to, to find an ultraviolet complete theory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, now one question uh, for for the audience, let's say. So uh, let's say that you want to convince a student to um, proceed in his her career towards this topic. So quantum gravity in general, but you know more uh, specifically on uh, effective field theory applied to gravity. So how would you convince him or her or her? Right. So. I mean, I think if the student has has heard about this incompatibility of quantum mechanics and gravity, the basic sales pitch is that you say that we were able to show that that's incorrect in certain regions. And so if all the field, the number of theoretical physicists working on quantum gravity in speculative ways, here you would have the chance to do something that's non-speculative and rigorous, giving real predictions of quantum gravity. So, I mean, yeah, we'll you know, just... That's what, that's the mo my motivation too, is, is, is I, I like the chance to say something solid about the theory of gravity. It's the most interesting quantum field theory that we we have at present because it's the it has features that we don't understand. And um it's clear that that we could make some progress. There's, a, there's pushing the the boundaries of this are are is it, it interesting. That's what keeps me going too. That's uh that's uh, an excellent selling point. Also, I mean if this is what keeps you going for sure, we'll, we'll convince some students as well. Um, right. And uh, so, yeah, I would like to, to um, um, let's say, as, as, as I mentioned, so we are, we are approaching the, the end of this, uh, um, of this conversation, this very interesting conversation. Uh, and we talked about many topics and different perspectives uh, well, different with respect to the usual, uh, let's say, fundamental uh, perspective on uh, on quantum gravity. So you mentioned uh, string theory, but you know we have also other candidates that will have a more, let's say, fundamental perspective uh, with implications that are usually hard to test. Um, so. Um, yeah, I, I think this this was a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting conversation, and I would like to thank you a lot for the insight and for all the the stories and the explanations on the topic. And uh, really, thank you. And uh, hopefully, this will be useful for well the students, uh, of course, and uh, everyone that wants to know a little bit more on the topic. So, thank you again. Well, thank you for asking me to do this. It's been, been fun.